Welcome to the New England and New York Real Estate Journal podcast. I'm your host, Rick Kaplan. My guest today is Aaron Duron, and he is with Suffolk Construction. Hi, Aaron. How are you? Good morning, Rick. I'm good. How are you? Good. So tell us a little bit about your journey to where you are today. Sure. Um, well, I mean, I grew up mostly in and around New York City, so that's that's what I know and love. Um, I, uh, after a brief stint as a teacher, after graduating from college, I went back to school at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn for architecture, uh, and quickly landed a job with one of my professors working in his architecture studio in New York, um, mostly, uh, focusing on like luxury residential, uh, renovation projects, some commercial, um, and while I enjoyed I uh, really enjoyed the the creativity of uh, the architecture and design world. Um, I realized that my my three plus years in that world, uh, the highlight of my week, we'll say every week, um, was going out and meeting with the contractors. Um, uh, like I said, I, I enjoyed the creativity, but I found that I was sitting behind a desk all day at an AutoCAD station, drawing details, you know, um, and uh, I really looked forward to the actual problem solving that happens in the field where the projects are getting built. Uh, so I made a career change and I moved into the um, construction side, uh, the building side of the equation, if you will. Uh, and I haven't looked back, frankly. Um, while I will say occasionally miss that creativity, uh, I, you know, that opportunity for creativity, I do find opportunities in the construction world to be creative. Um, so uh, I started really in the, the heavy civil world. Um, I worked with, with Judlaw Contracting for a number of years, then with Skanska Civil for, for a good decade plus. Um, and uh, I spent around seven plus years with Hunter Roberts, a little bit more on the building side, although kind of leaning towards the public and infrastructure world, um, since that was my background uh, professionally. Uh, and now I've been with Suffolk Construction for just about a year. Um, I'm really here to build out Suffolk's New York City, um, uh, New York metropolitan region um, public sector portfolio, because that's my strength. I've been really in the public sector primarily uh, and exclusively in New York for the bulk of my career since, um, you know, right around the year 2000. You know, that's that's very interesting because you know the the industry construction industry in itself there's been a, a a lot of talk in the past 10 years about how young people are not getting into the industry and uh you know even yourself you know you didn't you it doesn't sound like you decided when you were young to just go in that direction you found your way into this the the, the construction industry so would you what would you say to someone young or the young Aaron when he was uh at, you know coming up in the world what would you say to yourself you know maybe I should look into the construction industry and uh maybe I should go that direction yeah that's a good point um I don't think I was even really aware of careers in the construction industry uh when I was a young girl Aaron <laughs> uh, you know I think a lot of people outside of the industry, they view construction as either, you know, you're the, the guy or the gal in the field swinging the hammer uh, or chopping the concrete, or maybe you're the guy with the white hat and the clipboard barking orders, because that's what they see, you know, the rolled up blueprint under the arm, you know, that's what they see in, in a lot of media. Um, but they're not aware of um, all of the ways that you can get involved in construction um, or really in the architecture, engineering, construction industry as a whole. Um, but even just within construction, they're not aware of roles, um, you know, project management and what does that mean? Uh, I think they they view maybe superintendents as just, you know, an elevated form of, of trade labor. Um, uh, you know, they're not aware of risk management and contract law and estimating and pre-construction, um, uh, you know, uh, finance and accounting, um, 
Uh, and now with with digital technology on the rise in construction, also all of the um, you know virtual design and construction opportunities that there are in the industry. Um, so I guess what I would tell um, a younger Aaron, not that I really regret any of the decisions I made that got me here, I don't, um, but I would just have, have let a younger version of myself and I would let young people know that there are so many ways of being involved in the construction industry that can be very rewarding. Um, well, you, you know, yeah. I, I was going to get into this later, but I think it's a perfect segue from what you just said is uh, the cutting edge technology that has come into the industry, uh, which young people probably have no clue that it's even here. Uh, but it's almost the same. Uh, it, it's what they enjoy. A lot of this cutting edge, you know, with lasers and with uh you know, using the uh, the stick to control things, you know, uh, whatever they call the, uh, you know, but they have the uh, drones, they have all kinds of, you know, I mean, how is that, that changed the industry as well. So maybe you can talk a little towards that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you make a good point. It is what young people gravitate towards. It's what they're familiar with. It's what, you know, certainly my children are more familiar with. Um, uh, is the technology side of the industry, right? So you mentioned drones. I think you were alluding to like joysticks, like video games, and there's a lot of overlap. That was the word I was looking for, joysticks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of overlap um, where we're seeing those types of technologies become increasingly increasingly valuable in the construction industry. I mean, you could be a, a drone pilot uh, that's doing... Uh, as built or building inspections for uh, an engineering firm now, or for an arch or an architectural office, or uh, or a contractor, right? I mean, we we use drones in, on all of our projects just about these days. Um, you know, video games uh, also have a direct relationship. You know, kids grow up gaming, um, but they become very comfortable with these virtual three D interfaces. Sometimes they're even creating their own worlds, which is in a sense, an act of, of design and construction. Um, and, and there's a direct uh, applicability towards the, the, the AEC, architecture, engineering, and construction industry, where, you know, we are, we are building our buildings virtually before we ever get out, out onto a site and build the actual building. Um, you know, we use digital twins. We have, you know, exact detailed models of what we're going to build before we do it. It's part of our pre-construction and coordination process. So those same skills that might enable someone to be successful in, I don't know, I don't know the gaming world, Minecraft or whatever it might be, um, can really help uh, someone in the industry to be successful as well. So all of those things that you just mentioned are all the type of things that uh, young people like you like how you said you weren't aware of this when you were growing up I, I think a lot of young people they're not aware of this as well how is that word getting out to them do you know um yeah i mean at least through through my my work with suffolk um where of at least two ways that we're getting that word out um so suffolk participates in the ace mentorship program um uh, I'm one of the volunteers, and uh, we engage uh, high school students who are interested in learning more about the AEC industry. Um, and uh, we we have a we had a cohort this year of high school students that um, uh, really like worked with with Suffolk um, in our case in in the New York office with the Rockefeller Group, a developer, uh, and also with Cook Fox, the the um, architectural firm. Um, and that in that program, they um, uh, conceived of a project. First of all, we gave them an overview of the industry, the different roles, the different responsibilities, what it takes to build a project. But then they actually conceived of their own project and got to apply everything that they learned with, with Suffolk, Rockefeller Group, and Cook Fox Architects um, guiding them through the process. So they, they came up with a really... Um, uh, unique project idea. They wanted to build a Japanese restaurant on a rock in space. So we said, okay, well, let's talk about what, what you need to do to make that happen. How do you get materials to that job site in space? How do you create oxygen, 
you know how do you uh how do you bring or generate power and we we we've we um encourage the students to look at everything through a real world um you know aec lens right um this was not just coming up with with harebrained ideas we we explained like okay how do we budget this project um you know what kind of mechanical electrical systems do you think could work and gave them the tools to do that research and then put it all together and of course because it's today is what it is um they used a lot of you know uh, artificial intelligence type platforms to even create some of the renderings and concepts uh, you know they used chat gpt and and similar tools to generate ideas that to basically take the, their concepts and turn them into uh you know more detailed ideas so you know they just immediately gravitate towards the technology they're no strangers to google searches of course but now they're also no strangers to you know using ai tools which we're using as well in construction um so that's the ace mentorship program um uh which really gets uh you know high school age kids involved um, we also have our career start program uh which is you know in effect um uh it's our um uh, like a, uh, well, it's career start, right? So it's, it's in effect a, a way that we get people straight out of college and into our industry um, and engaged. Um, and it's a relatively competitive. Um, this year we had nearly 2,000 um, applicants. Uh, we hired about 46. So it's, it's I think, around a 2% acceptance rate. Um, and we, we take, you know, mostly people with technical degrees, so they're already aware of the industry, um, but they haven't necessarily experienced all of the aspects of the industry. And we put them through a rotation. Um, so they get exposed to various aspects of construction. So they go through um, project management, you know, field, which could be superintendent, assistant superintendent type roles, um, estimating digital engineering, which is the virtual design and construction, planning and scheduling, um, safety, risk management. So they get exposed to different um, aspects of the industry. They get they get a stint, essentially, in each of those roles. And then they can jointly, with their mentors in the program, choose a direction where they want to stay with Suffolk and focus their attentions. Oh, so Suffolk Construction is actually uh, aggressively going uh, oh, to uh, make young people aware of what's going on in the construction industry, to maybe give them that idea or career choice. Uh, yeah. the, they're, they're planting the ideas in their head for a career choice. Absolutely. And I wanted to mention also, uh, we do like nationally, uh, many industries, if not all industries have, you know, the take your child to work day. Um, and we we have that uh, we do that here in our New York office and across all of our offices. Um, but what impressed me, and this was the first year I had an opportunity to participate, and I brought two of my three daughters in, um, is we we use that also as an opportunity to give them a little bit of exposure to what what opportunities there might be for um, for young people coming up in the the construction industry. Uh, so they do a little, you know, hands-on projects of, you know, building a tower out of cardboard boxes or whatever it might be. Um, but they, we infuse that with um, some of our actually career start, you know, our young um, emerging professionals, uh, career start members uh, conduct some of these, like these mini classes in our um, Take Your Child to Work Day. So I found that really rewarding. And um, uh, my daughters learned a little bit about what I do every day. Well, that's another interesting point because uh, a lot of people, um, probably my age, even your age, which is a lot younger than me, uh, uh, didn't think of women in the construction industry. More and more women are, are getting into the construction industry now, and it's uh, it's a very good career for a woman. You know, there's a lot of uh, potential for them. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think we have a ways to go in the industry to bring more women in and to make um, not just to bring them in, but also to make the the industry and the culture more um, not just accepting, but more supportive for women in the industry. Um, but that being said, uh, you know, I've been in and around construction now professionally for around 24 years. 
And I've seen a massive change just in that relatively short time frame. Um, you know, I think, you know, I met a woman superintendent early on in my in my career in the early 2000s and thought that was almost mind blowing um, at the time. And now it's like, of course, well, we have women in every single aspect uh, of the of the organization and all in, in you know many, many leadership roles. Um, and I think that we are making great strides in becoming um, more inclusive and more representative. And I think that we are becoming, I shouldn't even say I think, I will say we are becoming better as an industry because of that. Uh, I think that a diversity of opinions and a diversity of experience and a diversity of approach uh, benefits our industry. Um, I know that Suffolk was one of the first to sign the, um, the Million Women in Construction Pledge um, and we're really focused on uh, bringing more and more women to the forefront in important leadership roles in our industry. Well, I'm proud to say that uh, the, there's a group, uh, Women in Construction, and I'm proud to say that uh, they had a bowling tournament and I was invited and I won. I got the trophy. <laughs> so <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So let's uh, let's move on to the, the city that you love, New York. Uh, the New York market and what's going on and what's, uh, you know, Mayor, uh, it's Mayor Adams, Eric Adams. So, uh, let's let's hear a little bit about what his plan is for the sure. city. You know, I mean, they had some tough years during the pandemic and even right. after, so. Very, yeah. I mean, the pandemic, you know, the lockdowns were uh, the first time that I saw a little bit of crack a little bit of a crack in the infrastructure of our city's construction pipeline. It was the first time that I was seeing jobs being shut down left and right, and even uh, public sector and infrastructure jobs, which I thought were effectively, you know, recession proof. Um, you know, I I had been in that um, public sector and infrastructure side all my career, and I always saw that when the housing market dried up, well, there was still work building some, you know, uh, improving the subway system. Um, but when uh, the COVID lockdown started, that was the first time that public funds had to be redirected away from some of the public sector work uh, towards, you know, COVID centers and, uh, you know, really emergency pressing needs. Uh, the city started to reevaluate what was absolutely necessary at that time. Fortunately, it was a relatively short lived blip on the radar. And I would say everything has resumed um, uh, and, and we're basically caught up now. Um, uh, uh, Mayor Adams, um, I'm sure you're aware, has rolled out this City of Yes campaign, um, which I think has a lot of elements that are going to help the construction industry um, not just recover, but really thrive and, and reach levels that it hasn't reached before. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do on the developer side with rezoning parts of the city, um, creating really much needed affordable housing. Um, there's also a, a big emphasis on uh, creating more equitable and sustainability, uh, more equitable and sustainable um, uh, opportunities. Um, you know, there's um, uh, economic growth is built into that that's that uh, city of yes program. Um, there's proposals to to really modernize the zoning requirements. Um, you know, fill you know, just uh, you know really obvious kind of low hanging fruit. Um, to fill up vacant storefronts, um, allow more businesses in different areas where they weren't able to exist before, um, improve streetscapes. That's something that I think we learned during the pandemic um, is the importance of like outdoor space, space to congregate. Um, you know, obviously we saw a lot of outdoor dining, um, but it really showed that, you know, showed our city what we can do with outdoor space if it's not just dedicated for you know, vehicular traffic, what else can we, you know, vehicular traffic and parking. Um, uh, there's um, programs that are, are aimed in part of the City of Yes programs that are aimed at in, uh, include increasing um, trees and plantings, which our city certainly needs uh, to address climate change. You know, we, we get that heat island effect and you just step under the shade of a tree and you feel, you know, 10 degrees cooler. Well, there's Part of that city of yes is actually to increase plantings and, and put more trees on our streets. Um, I, you know, I think everyone is talking about the the dire need for affordable housing. So there's tremendous increase in in housing opportunity uh, coming as part of the city of yes program. Um, 
you know, including, which I, I found interesting, I, it took me a while to kind of wrap my head around it, but the elimination of the parking space requirements for new developments, um, you know, my thought was, well, what does that do? That just puts more cars on the side, you know, parked on the sidewalks. But what it actually does is it enables you to build more housing um, when you no longer need to build parking spaces as part of your development, you can, you know, I think it's, what's the statistic, something like two, two parking spaces is like roughly the same square footage as a studio apartment. So if you take that requirement out, you can build more housing. Um, so did they change that to like one and a half sp spaces per unit or I, something like I, that? I, I think that the idea is new developments don't even necessarily need to have parking. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think it still needs to go through an environmental impact study and, and make that determination, but they've really relaxed those requirements to emphasize housing over parking, right? We're, we're trying to be a more, um, uh, you know, commuter-based, less vehicle-based, you know, public transportation-based city. Um, and then, of course, as part of the city of Yes, there's just a lot of programs that are, are aimed at carbon neutrality uh, and addressing climate change. Um, decarbonizing our energy grid, uh, you know, creating more EV charging infrastructure, uh, e-bike charging infrastructure, um, you know, energy efficient retrofits to buildings, to building envelopes, um, bio swales to, um, you know, relieve some of the burden on our uh, storm, you know, combined, combined storm and sewer system. Um, and what that does, I think, is it creates a lot of um, you know, creates a lot of opportunity for, for construction, for, for people like myself, for, for people in this industry. Um, it's going to drive a lot of, you know, drive the creation of a lot of jobs related to those projects to, to build, operate, and maintain the projects. Um, it's going to help our city become a leader in uh, climate change adaptation. That's going to create that affordable housing that we so desperately need. Um, I think it'll open the door to to more to more diverse group of developers, um, and ultimately, it's going to be a boon for the industry, for the city, and for our, our environment. Now, tell me a little bit about the project that you're working on, uh, with the, the, the public sector project, uh, the Jamaica Armory. Yeah. Um, so, Jamaica Armory project. Um, uh, I got involved. Um, the project was ongoing when I joined Suffolk uh, since around 2020, but I got involved basically to help bring it um, through through to completion. Um, we look to be wrapping up by the end of this year. Um, it's about a $100 million project. Uh, it's a modernization and a renovation of the Jamaica Armory in Jamaica, Queens. Um, it's a, about a 240,000 square foot building. It was built in the late 1920s. Uh, and it houses the New York National Guard. Uh, so the, the the project is basically a full renovation of the building. Um, we've added about forty thousand square feet of mezzanine space, uh, so increased increased the uh, the square footage. Um, you know, the project, as many projects in existing buildings do in New York, starts with demolition and abatement. You know, considerable uh, lead and asbestos uh, abatement and remediation. Um, you know, uh, putting in a new roofing system. There's some, you know, exterior masonry repointing, but also just a full interior renovation and modernization. Uh, you know, full new MEP systems, uh, elevators, vertical conveyance, um, data communications technology. Uh, and um, when, when this opens back up, it's going to contain um, uh, a firearms training range, you know, a kitchen mess hall, um, vehicle and equipment storage areas, uh, offices, support staff spaces, locker rooms, um, uh, you know, really a state-of-the-art facility for the New York National Guard. And you said this is, was originally, the building was built in 1929? Is that what you said? Yeah, 1928, 1929. Something yeah, like that. Yeah. And th this is the first update to it, a renovation? I think it's the to my knowledge, it's the first really comprehensive, like building-wide renovation. It's, it's definitely had a series of updates uh, through its history. 
Um, but this is one of the programs that, um, this is part of a program that the OGS, the Office of General Service, is undergoing, uh, just renovating uh, a number of the armories around, around certainly around New York City. I, I, I'm kind of tunnel vision, right? New York City almost exclusively. I've never, I've never worked outside of the five boroughs, so oh, I don't know okay. what's going on in the rest of the state <laughs> or the country that, that well. Well, I, you know, I, I do know in certain uh, areas they have closed some of the armories, so that it's kind of surprising that they uh, they're not consolidating some of those places for the armories. But you know, yeah. I guess every they have some kind of a strategy. It, they're still needed. Right? Let's hope. Let's hope they have a strategy. <laughs> yes, certainly. Yes. So, uh, are there any other projects? Well, this is almost at completion. Do you have a project that you're going to go to after this? Well, I sure hope so. Um, <laughs> you don't uh, have anything yet set. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm involved supporting a few other projects here, but um, uh, you know, part of or a large part of my role coming over to Suffolk was to help build out the public sector portfolio. So. Uh, I'm trying to build up that pipeline right now. I'm going after a number of um, a number of high profile projects. I shouldn't even say high profile. A number of variously profiled <laughs> projects. <laughs> um, uh, again, mostly public sector. Um, uh, you know, for in, within the five boroughs. That's that's my specialty. So you know, I I talk to a lot of people in the construction industry. You know, some of them are yeah, mostly commercial. Uh, the beginning of the year, or even the end of last year, a lot of the conversation was that we see a little bit of a slowdown coming. In the past two months, a lot of the conversation has been, well, we're starting to see things picking up again, things starting to uh, go back to the way it was in the peak of times. Uh, are you seeing that as well? Yeah, absolutely. That, that tracks, it seems to track across the industry right now. Um, uh, you know, I can't really speak as well to the commercial or certainly not to the like residential side of things where there might be more of a flattening of the curve. That's not my world. Um, but in the public sector, uh, you know, a lot of projects that had been paused during the pandemic um, or have picked, you know, re, re picked up. Um, pick back up and have moved forward uh, and are moving forward now. Um, you know, the City of Yes program that we were talking about really opens up a lot of opportunity for construction projects. Um, even the, um, you know, the federal, the, infra the in Inflation Reduction Act, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> um, the Inflation Reduction Act um, has injected a lot of capital into a lot of important programs that will really uh, help um, our industry. Um, so, uh, especially, you know, sustainable projects, projects with, with, um, uh, with, you know, lofty sustainability goals. Um, that's where we're seeing a lot of that, uh, IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act money getting funneled, um, you know, cleaning up the, the energy grid, um, uh, you know, just, you know, any, anything relating to climate change, um, uh, New York City is still, uh, you know, still fortifying its um uh its its borders if you will its its interface with the water since hurricane sandy or superstorm sandy um so there's still a lot of um resiliency improvements at our water's edge around manhattan staten island all all, all five boroughs really um to prepare for the next i would say inevitable you know storm surges that were that we uh, expect to see um, so there's, you know, e even just in that sustainability and resiliency space, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. One other thing before we go, one other question, and this, this is uh, something that I, I've gotten from engineers that have been working on different uh, uh, retrofitting properties in, in the New York, New Jersey, New York, uh, since that building collapsed in Miami. Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of focus on existing properties that have these cement garage, you know, with multi floors and also uh, buildings, multifamily buildings, especially in New York City, where there could be like a 30, 40 story building. Uh, is there a call for a lot of uh, these buildings to have 
constant inspections of any kind of faulty type, especially in a, the public sector, you know, because there's a lot of garages that fall yep. into that category. Yeah, you mentioned the the, the building collapse, the really hor horrific event in Miami, and then it wasn't that long afterwards that there was the um, garage collapse in Lower Manhattan, yes, um, on Ann Street. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not going to opine on you know the exact structural cause of that, um, uh, but I do know at least it, at least it came up at the time that that vehicles are getting heavier, um, and you know, you know, you know, electric vehicles are as heavy as large trucks, even small electric vehicles, because they're batteries. Uh, trucks, you know, people are driving bigger and bigger vehicles in general, whether EVs or or regular internal combustion vehicles. Um, and the the city's um, uh, inspection program may not have really been keeping up with that, and just in general not keeping up with. Um, uh, this, you know, noting and addressing structural deficiencies, um, building owners, landlords may have been able to just pay fines rather than addressing some of those structural deficiencies. So I know, um, uh, I would say more immediately as a result of that garage collapse in, in, uh, in the financial district, um, the DOB has ramped up uh, in the inspection frequency and protocols and really put a lot more in place to ensure that um, structural deficiencies are identified and addressed. Uh, and, and, you know, if, if they can't be addressed, buildings need to be vacated or, or made safe in some way. Yeah. I mean, I would think well, I'm, I'm surprised we haven't had a lot more of this, that issue because in the Northeast with all the salt that we put into the, uh, onto the yep. streets and the cars are tracking throughout, you know, the whole city, yeah. you know, how does that not deteriorate the concrete and, and now we're talking about the uh, the, the sea levels rising, yeah. you know. And I know I'm here in Boston. One winter we had the down the, the right along the sea coast, a lot of the seawater was, you know, flooding the area. You know that seawater is going to do a lot of damage to some of these uh, properties. Absolutely. I mean, certainly modern and current building code is is really geared at addressing that um you know you're using more epoxy coated rebar or rebar with with some kind of corrosion resistance um you know higher performance concretes with additives that really can address that salt water environment or that salt environment that we get just from road salting even if you're not on the water's edge um uh you know seismic uh regulations for for all new construction in new york um, because we're not, uh, you know, we're not immune to the seismic events that some of the rest of the country sees here. We, we had an event this, I think it was this calendar year, um, uh, you know, no destruction, but enough that, that everyone felt it. Um, so I think the modern and current building code is addressing that, but I think what's really, uh, at risk is our, is some of our aging building and infrastructure. And that's where, um, inspections and um and you know reinforcement programs come into play so aaron if someone was interested in getting a hold of you uh could they go to the the suffolk website to find you if they had a question about this or yeah you, you, um, you're also looking for future uh, uh projects maybe someone sure. else <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know that you'll find me on the Suffolk website yet, um, <laughs> um, but certainly, you know, you can you can reach out to Suffolk, uh, any, you know, main office or New York City office and find me there. Um, we're based in Boston. So, you, you know, uh, I'm sure if you call Boston and ask for me, but um, probably easiest way to find me is just on social media. I'm on LinkedIn is, is probably my primary presence for social media. Just search my name i think i'm the only aaron Daron out there on linkedin probably <laughs> uh, one of the benefits of having a unique name um okay. but i would love to to get in touch with anyone i would love to hear from anyone that has feedback from this um anyone that's interested in in working with me working with suffolk construction um and certainly any clients agencies trade partners subcontractors um you know i'm always looking to grow my network um, you know, really across the board, um, you know, consulting architectural firms, 
uh, great subcontractors, you know, owners, clients, owners, reps, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm looking to, to grow my network. Absolutely. Well, Aaron, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. And you did give That's us right. quite a few, quite a bit of information about what's going on in that sector of the industry. I do appreciate that. Thank uh, you, Rick. And, and we were talking with Aaron Doron, and he is with Suffolk Construction. And again, thank you so much. And um, I want to thank everyone for listening to the show. You're listening to the New England and New York Real Estate Journal podcast. I'm your host, Rick Kaplan. And until next time. Thank you.